instruction I felt he gave me to suggest to you. I heard this once by a guy named Henry Blackaby who wrote the book Experiencing God. He's a good old boy, really good old boy. And he said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you during a message, do not shove it off. Do not push it away. Do not say, I'll deal with that later. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. If the Holy Spirit comes upon you at any point in this message, I want you to raise your hand right then, right then. If it's a conviction, if it's an answer, if it's a comfort, or get on your knees right where you are. Just kneel and say, God, I hear you. God, I believe this. God, I know this is for me. In addition, I do believe, and I'm a big, big, well, kind of fan like um, Dwayne is of dead people. Um, one of my favorite dead people is Oswald Chambers. And I'm going to quote him a lot today, but here's what he says. When a truth is when a truth of God is brought home to your soul, never allow it to pass without acting on it internally in your will. Record it with ink and blood and work it into your life. I want you to take out a piece of paper and a pencil, and I want you to write down those things that God says to you today because he's going to say something. And when you walk out of here, here's what else Oswald Chambers says. When God speaks to you on the mountaintop, do not go down off the mountaintop and not do what he tells you to do. So I'm telling you today, God's going to say something. He may have already said it to you. He may cement it. He may confirm it right to you. I want you to write it down. I want you to hold it in your Bible all year long. I want you to say, this is what God said to me at one thing. This is what I walked away with. I don't want you to get a month from now and go, hey, I don't feel like doing it. Oswald Chambers also says it is easier to be excessively fanatic than consistently faithful. Not bad. It's not bad to be excessively fanatic. It's easier to be excessively fanatic than it is to be consistently faithful. I stand here 30 years married. I know Mike Bickle does. I know Dwayne Roberts does. But I want you to know Three of my seven pastors have had affairs. Most of the people I started in ministry with 30 years ago, of our little team of 10 couples, two or three are still married. Now, I'm going to tell you something. It is easier to be all fired up at 19, 20, 21, but I'm standing here at 53, fired up and more in love with Jesus Christ than I ever was. And I'm telling you, this, this, Richard Foster says, we fool ourselves if we think that such a sacramental way of living is automatic. We must desire it and seek it out. We must order our lives in particular ways. We must take up a consciously chosen course of action that will draw us more deeply into perpetual communion with the Father. Are you with me? I mean it. I'm ready. I love to dance. I wanted to be out here with you, but you got to dance on the streets. You got to dance when nobody's looking. You got to be the same person in private that you are in public, yes? And today I believe God is calling you that. This is the end of the year. This is goodbye 2007. This is hello 2008. And I am a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am an ambassador. I am going to do the will of God that I heard him speak to me on the mountaintop. Amen? Okay, now I'm going to reiterate what I said when I began. If the Holy Spirit of God speaks to you, you raise your hand or you kneel or you get on your face or say amen. I'm good for amen. Are you with me? Okay, I'm going to open up with Charles Finney's prayer. Father, I pray for an immediate outpouring of your Holy Spirit in this place that not one of us would leave the same person that we entered, that we would be equipped and empowered, that we would be convicted and comforted, that we would be called, that we would make non-negotiable decisions in the areas of prayer and purity and purpose all the days of our lives. Amen? 60 years ago, 60 years ago, in 1947, a woman named Henrietta Mears got up and preached a sermon to about 200 college students, or college-age young adults. At the end of the service, a couple guys came to her room and said, golly, we feel compelled, we feel God speaking to us. 
We feel like we're to be expendable for the Lord Jesus Christ. So they did something radical, excessively fanatic at the time. They spent all night in prayer. They had not yet heard and known about y'all who do 24-7 prayer. They spent all night in prayer, and most of the time they spent in confession. And at the end of that all night in prayer, they decided to call themselves the Fellowship of the Burning Heart. They have burning hearts, and they said, for all the days of our lives, not as long as we feel like it, not as long as we're young, not as long as we can do this, not if we're in full-time ministry, because one of them was just a business person, they said, for all the days of our lives, we're going to do four things. One, the first will be to spend no less than one hour a day in prayer and the Word. Andrew Murray says, prayer and the Word are inseparably linked together. Power in the use of either is dependent on the presence of the other. One of uh, Dwayne's favorite books is uh, by Tozer. Tozer talks about um, knowing God in such a way where your time with Him. He says, wait on God, get alone, preferably with your Bible out spread before you. Then if you will, draw near to God and begin to hear Him speak into our hearts. Prayer is a two-way conversation. These men and women of God said, for one hour a day, for the rest of our lives, we will spend one hour a day in prayer. I want to tell you, I made that decision in February 1984. For over 8,500 hours, meaning 8,500 days, I've had a one-hour appointment with the king. I've opened my Bible every single day, and guess what? Not one day has gone by where I go, hey, I don't need to hear God. Hey, I don't need what he has to say. I'm usually desperate. I am desperate for God to speak to me. One hour every day is often not enough, but I've made a commitment. And I am the least likely to be organized, sit still, or be quiet. So for God to get me alone for one hour a day in itself is a miracle. So I am saying to you, not one of you can say to me, well, I can, I'm going to tell you, every one of you should be able to say, if she can do it, I can do it. But I am telling you, just when Jennifer stood up here yesterday and said, I'm a mother, and I'm busy, and I'm cleaning the refrigerator. Some of you mothers and fathers will be standing cleaning a refrigerator one day. And you're not going to be in full-time ministry, and you're not going to live close to a prayer room, and you're going to be kind of dull and dim-hearted. And God is saying, you make a commitment now when you're young to spend alone time with me every day. Henry Nowen, great author, says... The very first thing you need to do is set apart a time and a place to be with God and Him alone. The concrete shape of this discipline of solitude will be different for each person. But a real discipline never remains vague or general. It's concrete and specific as daily life. I can tell you why I made a decision to pray one hour a day. I was out of control. I was in ministry. I was overworked. I was underpaid. I was bitter and angry and jealous and overweight and in debt. And I went to work every single day to disciple hundreds of teenagers. I had no time for God. I overslept. I hit the snooze button. And I read my Bible in order to plan a Bible study. Does this sound familiar to anybody? Oh, I see some hands. Are you getting me? Is the Holy Spirit speaking to you? And God took my little scruff of my neck and he said, if you want to be a world changer, what you do, you must get alone with me. Henry Nolan says, to shake off your compulsions. John Owen about 300 years ago said, sin never wavers. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, there's a devil who prowls around looking for someone to devour. You're it. I'm it. You must come alone every day and let God speak to you. And sometimes it hurts. That one hour a day for me has been non-negotiable. Oh, I dig the prayer rooms. I'm, I'm proud. I'm excited. I'm fired up. But for me, my time alone with God is serious. We've got business to do every day. Not if I feel like it. Andrew Murray, great book. Christ in the School of Prayer. 
or Inner Life by Andrew Murray. He said, don't pray, or uh, uh, Corey Ten Boom said, don't pray when you feel like it. Andrew Murray said, you never will. Okay, any hands? Make an appointment with the king and keep it. A man or woman is powerful on their knees. Are we going to change our nation by talking? We're going to change our nation through prayer. Yes, but personal revival starts here. Is my heart on fire? Is my cup clean? That one hour day with God when those people said, we're going to change the world for the Lord Jesus Christ. They started here, right here. The second thing they said, we're going to live in complete sobriety. And the third thing, complete chastity. Wow. If they only could see us now, 60 years later. I'm going to tell you something. For every prayer room I've been to, a young man, Christian leader, has said to me, I lead the prayer focus on this campus, and I'm addicted to pornography. Now, I'm telling you, we got trouble right here in River City. The call to purity, the call to be set apart, and you've heard it over and over on this pulpit, is to flee is to run, is to turn from. My husband always says, Gee, everybody loves the Jesus who says, I forgive you. They're not so fired up about the Jesus who says, go and sin no more. Now, come on. The call to purity in our nation will look so completely different. You must look different. You must look set apart for somebody to even notice you. And what will they notice, that you're groveling or that you're a dancing, fired up, on fire person who loves the Lord Jesus Christ, who doesn't call it a sacrifice, who says, this isn't about me. This is about honoring the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I will not shame his name. I will not. When I say a vow to get married, thick or thin, ugly, good, when I went, when I got married, I went up to 185 pounds, pregnant. Sat on my husband's lap, he said, that hurts. Could you just sit here? He didn't say you're ugly, you're, cute, you're not cute. He said, oh, this is going to be one of those thick or thin times. No, he didn't. He's a man who's never told anyone other than me that I look cute. He's never flirted. He wouldn't flirt with me when we were single. He won't flirt with other women. When he asked me to marry him, he had never even kissed me. I said yes, and we've been married 30 years. This call to purity, chastity, holiness is a call to be God's person, to reflect him, to be shiny. Not, I'm an unhappy Christian. You know, I, I, I went to University of Illinois. Tomorrow, tomorrow, you will see Jay Lehman, a, a defensive player, a senior who for three years lost everything. And then this year, they beat Ohio State all over ESPN. The next week, I stood with Jay Lehman as he stood in front of 500 kids and he said, I'm a virgin. And I'm going to be a virgin till I get married. And I don't get drunk. And I don't swear. And the whole, I mean, everybody just went, oh, my goodness. You, me. I'm going to tell you something. The day I became a Christian, I didn't need somebody to tell me to move out of my apartment with my boyfriend. Jesus told me that. I didn't need to read a Bible. I didn't need to have it. I can't tell you how many Christians I meet on Christian college campuses who are sleeping together. I'm like, what are you thinking? What are you doing? Yes, I, you know them. You know them. Charles Spurgeon, I love this guy. Getting, I'm getting excited. Okay. He says, may you, I'm not seeing a whole lot of hands. Is God speaking to you? May you possess the grand moral characteristic of courage, pursuit of God, holiness of God, 
Jerry Bridges says, holiness is moral blamelessness. Come on, let's not run from it. Let's dig into it. Let's love it. Let's be God's happy people who are virgins, who know his word, who love his word, who will obey it when it hurts. Why? Because he'll be glorified. He'll be made known. It won't be about you. You know what those young high school boys said about Jay Lehman? His God is a big God. His God. I want his God. Charles Stanley says, possess the grand moral characteristic of courage. By this we do not mean impertinence, impudence, or self-conceit, but real courage to do and say calmly the right thing and to go straight on at all hazards, though there should be none to give you a good word. Friends, you're going to stand alone. You're going to have to stand alone, and you're going to have to stand tall, and you're going to have to be bold. I don't care how little you are. I don't care how young you are. I don't care if you're a man or a woman, a boy or a girl. Jesus is enough to stand in you and up against anything and anyone. Are you fired up? He said, I am astonished at the number of Christians who are afraid to speak the truth to their brethren. Men and women, when you see it, you know my pastor, fired up guy. Church grows from 300 to 3,000. He has an affair. He's a young man. The pastors around him are like, how did that happen? We didn't, we didn't recognize it. I'm telling you, put the feelers up. When the Holy Spirit of the living God says, go to your friend, ask him, ask her, are you being pure in your relationship in which you're dating? I saw some hands here. If somebody used foul language and they're a believer in leading Bible study, you call them on it. You said the Bible doesn't say that. What are you doing? I don't care what your peers do. I don't care what your pastors or parents do. We've learned that, haven't we? You must know what the Word of God says, and you must be able to speak it to your brethren. And if you're a young person, you can do this. You should do this. You, young can stand for the Lord Jesus Christ among your parents. I led both my parents to Christ after I became a Christian. Within like a couple of months, a couple of, I was like all over everybody. I was the kind of Christian Christians don't even like to be around. Why? Because I was a filthy, dirty girl who was an alcoholic, a drug addict. I took speed every day, bought dope. I lived with my boyfriend. I thought I was pregnant, and I didn't know by whom because every single time I drank, I ended up in bed with somebody. And on the day I'm in court, elbow taken by the side, lawyer saying in my little 21-year-old face, you lie on the stand, you'll be crucified. This American-born child realized there's only one person in my whole life I've ever heard of who was crucified, and that was Jesus Christ. And at 21 years old, at the end of that court hearing, I drove to a church, the kind of church my parents had raised me in, the sit, kneel, stand, sit, kneel, stand kind. And nobody was there except the janitor. And the janitor, when I ran up in a mini skirt, platforms, okay, it was the 70s, disco dancing kind of gal, Broken, suicidal. I knew I would commit suicide that day. Hopeless. My father was an alcoholic. His father was an alcoholic. My aunt was in a treatment center alcoholic. I was going nowhere, and I knew it. He said, do you want to ask Jesus Christ to come into your life? And I didn't say, what's my boyfriend going to say? How's this going to change my life? When you're desperate, the good news is good news. Now, now you think right now, who are these people in your life that are desperate? I want to tell you something. You are supposed to speak to them about the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't need a janitor. They need you. You to be bold and say, there's no hope there. There's no answer.
answer in living with boys. There's no satisfaction in drugs and alcohol. I know the answer you're looking for. I have that answer. I want to introduce you to the Lord Jesus Christ. Come with me. Let's open the Bible. Let's talk about it. This janitor saved my life. I was 21 years old and said a simple prayer. Dear Jesus, come into my heart. He said, ask God to forgive you of your sins. If you can think of any of them, name them. Okay. I start back at the wedding where I slept with a man I didn't know, woke up and knew I could be pregnant and I wouldn't know by whom. Knew I had to come home and tell my boyfriend. I took coke, I smoked dope, I took speed. Any sins? You know, people struggle with calling themselves sinner. Not an option. You're a sinner. I just knew it. I was willing to say I hate it. This is why I look at my Christian friends and say, what are you doing? What are you thinking? I'm going to tell you, I was on a team with two people who were leaders, who every time we'd go out to speak for a Christian meeting, they would go to R-rated movies and invite me. I would not go. They said words I would not say. They drank. I would not join in. They were divorced by the end of the nine-month tour. They had had affairs, I'm telling you. There is a place for purity in a believer's life to guard your heart all the days of your Christian life. Not just now, not just single. When you're in ministry, all the days of your life. So when the guy says to me, this janitor, ask God to fill you with his spirit. I'd never heard of the Holy Spirit. I'd only heard of the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit. Sounded way friendlier. So true to form. And here's the form. I know how to drink. I know how to get drunk. I never drank without getting drunk. Never. I knew how to get drunk. That's why I think I'm a really fun Christian. I get full. J. Oswald Sanders says, you're as full of the Holy Spirit as you want to be. I want to be. Do you want to be? Yes. So what did it take? It took a baby, brand new, one second old Christian to say, fill me up overflowing with an extra measure of your Holy Spirit. The janitor's eyes were like, whoa, I got a hot one. He says to me as I'm running out the door, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, when you become a Christian, you become a brand new person inside. All things pass away and all things become new. I believed Ralph the janitor. I moved out of my apartment with my boyfriend. I quit smoking, drinking, swearing in a day. I look at my Christian friends and say, is not this the same Holy Spirit? Is it not? Who will take the worst? And radically tell her, I love you so much. I have a plan for your life. One day a man will respect you and love you. Your past is gone. Run out this door. It's all new. When my boyfriend came home, I said, I've become a Christian. He said, what? Christians are weak people. Why did you move out of our apartment? I said, well, we can get married. He said, I don't want to get married. That was painful. I believed that he loved me. He wanted to marry me. Lie, lie, lie. I looked right in this man's face and I've never been so strong. And I never let him have me again. And I am telling you, if God would do that for me, you can leave this place. And I know he will do it for you. But you must hate your sin. You must hate that which humiliates God. Sin hates God. Sin humiliates God. You let it in, you humiliate God. You got to hate it. You got to hate, you just don't get near the fire. These people made commitments to prayer, then purity, 
and then purpose. Now listen to me all. This is the piece I think is for us today. I don't know what the, that other stuff was. Anyway. They made a decision to lead one person to Christ every year. Now I can't tell you how many Christians I meet who don't know how to lead someone to Christ. I can't tell you how many Christians I meet who've never led someone to Christ. I am telling you, if it wasn't for a janitor, I don't know where I'd be. I wake up every morning and go, whose janitor can I be? Second Corinthians 5, 17 through 20, what does it say? Here's what was so cool about becoming a Christian by a guy who said to me, you're just so favored by God. He has a plan for your life. Go out and tell everybody you know Jesus Christ. He didn't say to me, don't tell anybody because you're really out there and we need you to get all straightened up. I was crazy person. I'm like, you won't believe this. I said this prayer. I've asked Jesus Christ to come to my life. They're my like, gosh, oh my gosh, you've had a nervous breakdown. I'm like, oh, well, it feels really good. One girl, one girl was from the South. She says, wow, Maggie, you've been saved. I'm like, what? She goes, you have been born again. I didn't even know what I had done. I thought the janitor and I were the only Christians in America. Because I never met anybody so on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ. I never met anybody tripping over themselves to talk about it. I never met anybody like that. And I just couldn't stop thinking. Everybody wants to know him. Everybody wants to know him. And you know what I believe? I believe your generation. In 30 years of ministry, I have never seen a hungrier generation than your generation. This call to purpose, and I mean it, this is a call to purpose that these people held on to lead one person to Christ each year. Do you know who one of those people was in 1947, the original Fellowship of the Burning Heart? His name was Bill Bright. He was a businessman. He didn't, he didn't even have an organization yet. By the time he died, 50 million people were said to have come to Christ through the organization of Campus Crusade for Christ. Here's a man who knelt one day with three other people and said, I will lead at least one person to Christ each year. What does God want to do in you? I'm going to tell you, a real harvest. I mean, a real revival is a harvest. It isn't just happy praying people. It is praying people who live pure lives and who are empowered to go out and lead the lost to Christ. And they're there. So, my question, are you sold out to prayer? Is it a conversation between you and someone you love? Or is it a duty? Is it a, something you're logging into? Here's what I... I feel prayer is for me. It is so I might live in a state, as Henry Nowen says, of ongoing preparedness so that when someone who is drowning in the world comes into my world, I am ready to reach out and help. About six months ago, I was on my way to Kansas City, got on the airplane, next to a college girl, it was evident. She was totally cute, had on the sweatshirt with, you know, I go to this school. I was on the wrong flight, I was in the wrong seat, and I plopped down and went, I'm here for a reason. Now I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you now. You are to be a living, walking furnace so hot in the heart that you're going to have to say what I say when I sit down in an airplane next to a stranger. How long will it be till the heat gets felt? How long will it be till the person next to me knows that the Lord Jesus Christ is all over them? She says, oh, I say, where are you going? I'm going to see my ex-boyfriend. I say, ex-boyfriend, what are you going to see your ex-boyfriend for? Well, 
he wants to get back together. And I'm like, oh, do you? I don't know. I said, do you love him? She said, I don't know. I say, it's been one minute. <laughs> Are you going to sleep with him? She says, probably. I said, why? I don't know. I said, that's a bad reason. I said, if you were my daughter, I'd say, get off in Denver and go back home. She said, my mom said, go have a good time. I got an assignment in that moment. You are a spiritual mother. You are to love this girl to the Lord Jesus Christ right now. Do not let her get off the plane without hearing me plead with her. Tell her to come home. I love you. Tell her she's mine. Tell her she's precious. Tell her I sent you to sit next to her and put your arms around her. I took two hours. Oh, I, th I oh. gave her my testimony. I got off the plane with her. I laid my hands on her. I prayed for her, and I said, you know what? We both live in California. Why don't you and I meet for breakfast Tuesday at Denny's? She's like, okay. She was a senior, captain of her athletic team at a state school in California. Senior captains are on time. 8 a.m. Tuesday morning, she was at breakfast at Denny's. She cried through the whole breakfast. Shaking, she handed me a note. She said, I'm going to break up with this guy. I want you to read the note. I'm like, oh, no, he's going to stalk me now. <laughs> I read the note. I pray for her. I said, would you want to go to breakfast next week, Tuesday, same place, same time? She said, yeah. She sent the note, changed her phone number, met me for breakfast, and I looked right in her face, and I said, you, you know, this boy or no boy will ever fill the emptiness in your heart. Do you want to ask the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your life and be your Lord and Savior? Do you believe he is the Son of God who died for you? Are you willing to repent of your sin, to call what you've been doing sin in your life, to invite the Holy Spirit, the all-powerful, supernatural comforter and convictor, the indwelling instructor to live within you all the days of your life? Do you want to invite him in? because you can expect a change from the moment you say this prayer. And you will feel God. You will feel assurance. You will feel peace. You will feel relief. Your shame will go away. Do you want to say that prayer without a second? She said, yes. Now, I'm telling you, that girl's been a senior on a campus for four years. I'm a perfect stranger, and I was next to her one minute. I am telling you, just as like I'm telling me. This generation is hungry, and you're it. The people you sit next to in class, the people on your dorm floors, the people in your apartment houses, the people at your workplace, you're it. You're the hot, fired-up furnace, prepared, full of prayer, on guard, alert, full of the gospel. The That's right. Is your prayer life preparing you to be an ambassador of the living, loving God, reconciling others to him? Do you get up and think, today is about me, today is about my prayer life, or is today about, I have the answer to what this dying generation is looking for. He lives in me. He is a hot, fiery furnace. And believe me, if your cup ain't clean, get it clean before you leave here. Because there is one entire work, one entire year of work for you to do. Here's my thought. Why, why only one person a year? Why? Why not one a month? Why not one a week? Why not? Why not share the gospel once a day? Why not? I'm not hearing amen. Charles Spurgeon.
Virgin, a book for every man and woman who wants to preach. It's called The Soul Winner. It is a, it is a lectures to pastors on how to preach. I've read it three times. Chapter one, sentence one, the chief business of a Christian is soul winning. That should have gotten more, yeah. I believe God is asking you to shift something today. Is it your chief business to win souls to Christ? Do you know how to do it? Can you say to a person, and I'm going to give you Charles Spurgeon's little five-point outline. It spells grief. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who came to earth? who died on a cross, who was buried and raised and lives today. This is a problem with Muslims and Jews. You are going to have to get through point B. For Americans who've grown up in the church, not so difficult. When I became a Christian, I did not go, I don't believe in Noah's Ark. I believed. I believed that Jesus is the Son of God. But you must Articulate that with the person you're sharing Christ with. Will you repent? And what is repentance? Will you confess any known sin in your life? If you are with a person and leading them to Christ, stay there till the last sin is confessed. Why? They will be free. They will be free. Get it out of their mouths. Get it out of their hearts. Get it out of their minds. Confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. Why did I go away? I did not need to sleep with my boyfriend. I knew what was sin in my life because the janitor took about one hour of confession out of me. He made me renounce the devil. I had never even thought of the devil. He said, will you renounce him? I'm like, sure. He said, have you ever done witchcraft? I'm like, no. He said, have you ever used the Ouija board? I said, yes. He goes, renounce it. I'm like, okay. I didn't just, I did everything he said to me. Renounce this, renounce that. What happened on the Welsh Revival? Confess any sin, give up any doubtful habit. Immediately obey the Holy Spirit and publicly profess your faith in Christ. I had a revival. I still have a revival. I wake up every morning and say, I will confess my sins in writing every single day. This is my prayer journal for one hour a day. I confess my sins in writing. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. And test me and know my anxious thoughts. Do you think he says, none today? I said something about my pastor because I was hurt. And I said it in front of Dwayne and my husband was there. We went back to our room and my husband said, that was wrong and that was bad and you better go apologize. And I went, arg. The first thing I saw Dwayne this morning, I said, I have to confess a sin to you. I've asked God to forgive me, but I said a slanderous word against my pastor because I was hurt. What do I want? I want a clean heart. I don't want to have it. How many of you know your habits right now? Got to go, got to go. Revival should be happening every day in your life so that you're clean, so you're fired up. Do they believe? Will they repent of their sins? Genuine repentance. Turn, run, hate, end it. Let me give you a little secret. When young men say to me, I'm going to try to quit pornography, that ain't the answer. Trying is your red flag. I will get on my face. I will throw out my computer. I will become accountable. I will tell my girlfriend, my boyfriend, my pastor. I will hate it. I will confess it as sin. I will speak it in public. Do you know why it's really easy for me to say I'm an alcoholic? No one offers me a drink. That's good when you're an alcoholic. I don't tell anybody they offer me a drink. I'm having to make a decision. When I say this is sin in my life, they don't go, hey, let me take you right there into sin. Normally, they say, let's see if she falls. Invite the Holy Spirit into your life. You, you, so many times people lead people to Christ without saying, will you invite the Holy Spirit into your life? Do you know who the Holy Spirit is? He's a holy person, not a holy emotion. He's a holy person, the comforter, the convictor, the truth bringer. Holy 
Holy Spirit, breathe in, Holy Spirit, breathe out junk. Breathe in, Holy Spirit, breathe out junk. Breathe in, Holy Spirit, fill me, Holy Spirit. You know what Charles Finney prayed every time he went into a revival meeting? I've prayed it ever since I read it, and something always happens. I pray for an immediate outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Invite, invite, invite. Secondly, third, fourth, believe, repent, but expect. Expect. Tell them you can expect to change. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, when anyone becomes a Christian, they become a brand new person. Old things pass away. All things become new. What can you expect to be different? Well, you can talk to God. If you've never talked to God, let's talk to God right now. Have you seen people who've never talked to God pray like nobody? Yes. Give them the opportunity. Tell them you can expect God to give you eyes that are new. Blinders will go off. What did I do? I walked in my apartment. I didn't go to a Bible study. I hadn't been to a crusade. I hadn't heard a church meeting. I hadn't even opened a Bible. And I knew you got to move out. You got to move out today. You got to move out before that guy gets back. Because when you see his cute little face walk in that door, you're not going to have the guts you got right now. You take the guts when God gives them to you. Just do it. Do it now. Don't do it later. That's why I say when the Holy Spirit speaks, you raise your hand. That's right. Is God talking to you today? Are you? Fifth, you will feel God. Let me tell you, let me tell you, every kid that I lead to Christ wants to feel God. You tell them you can feel God. You stay there till they feel God. You put your arms on them. You hold their hands. You pray with them. You let them cry. You let them feel the heat in their cheeks. Let them feel God. You tell God, come on down. They want to know you're real. Is he real to you? Is he all over you? Can you feel him? Really? You are not convincing me. telling you, if God is talking to you like he's talking to me about a month ago, I got this thought. I want you to go to the juvenile detention center. I am 53 years old. I have been an evangelist 30 years. I have never been to a juvenile detention center, but I called my church. I called my outgoing reach pastor. I said, dear pastor, is there any way we can go to the juvenile detention center? And I would like a band, please. He said, okay, let me do a little work. Within about a day, I get an email back from the chaplain of the juvenile detention center. There are 100 children who on December 16th will come to a church service because they're not allowed out other than that. And it will be somewhat of a relief to get out of there. They will have to put their heads on the table. There will be guards all around the room. They will not be able to stand. They will not be able to raise their hands. But you can come. I said, we're going. Because I got the answer. I know what they need. I know what they want. I know who can turn this all around. And it just started building and building and building in me. So I, I said to my son, my son and I don't usually do ministry together. He's a soccer playing missionary and I'm not. But I said to my son, would you want to go to the detention center with me? Would you want to bring your girlfriend? I said to my husband, would you want to go to the detention center? Because I asked the chaplain if we could pray for the children. And the chaplain said, no. I was hurting. I'm like, oh, God. I get an email back. He goes, well, we could pray for them if they don't move. And we go behind them and put one hand on a shoulder I said, deal. So my pastor gets like the best band in the church almost. That's right. We all check in on December 16th, belts off, shoes off, the whole bit. I'm trembling. I'm trembling because the night before, I get a little word from the Lord, and here it is. And when you get a word from the Lord, you got to write it down, amen? 
and I stood there like this. You know, I was more nervous to speak to them than I am to you because this was life or death. This was do or die. This is now or never, and I knew it. God was sending me in. He was saying, I want in there. I want in there. Somebody needs me today. You get there. I stood there, and I said, if you've been crying in your bed at night, and you're so angry at God, and you won't even acknowledge that he exists, or you blame him for what's going on, he wants you to know he's heard you, and he loves you, and he's not the reason for your pain or your problems. He's the answer. Then I shared my testimony, and I said, if you have an empty heart, would you just raise your hand? And I forgot I wasn't really supposed to do that. <laughs> and invite the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart. And the biggest, brutest guys are in there for two years. And if you were in there for two years, it's not good. Shot their hands up. My only disappointment, only like three quarters of the room went, not full room. Three quarters of that room raised their hand for the Lord Jesus Christ. Then I said, no, young men and women, you sit down because we're probably in trouble. And you put your elbow on the table if you want someone to pray for you. And my husband, my son, and his girlfriend, and me, and my pastor, God allowed us 20 minutes. And I'm going to tell you, when I laid my hand, I'd say to this little boy, how do you want me to pray for you? I don't want to do this anymore. Okay. I want to, I want to get out of here and be different. Okay. I'm going to tell you something. You're it. I'm just a good old girl. But on the airplanes and in the classrooms and in the detention homes and all around you is a generation. You can be a spiritual parent if you're just a couple years older. I took the girl on the airplane to church on Mother's Day. She gave me a Mother's Day card. That's right. I'm going to tell you something. I invited all those kids in the detention center to come to our church. I'm like, oh boy. But you're it. Today, I am supposed to call you to a prayer life that is consistently faithful and excessively fanatic. I want to meet you in 20 years when I'm older. And you say to me, that day I heard you talk, I've had an appointment with the king every day since. I have opened my Bible, I have let him speak to me. And God has used that time to make me a better woman, a better man, oh, a better prayer, fully prepared. And I live in purity. I've been single and, and, and pure. I've been married and pure. I want to hear you say that. I want to hear you say, I have loved the wife or the husband of my youth all the days of my life. I want your children to hear what my children sees, my child sees. He sees a praying mom. He sees a woman who gets regularly corrected by her husband. He sees an on fire. I never did minister with my son. Some people are out on the road all the time with their kids. This was a gift for me. I saw my son kneel by a little prisoner boy, and I realized my son has had a praying parent all his life. My son has had a doling, fasting, praying mother. These kids don't. And my son, blessing that. My son can say he's a virgin and getting married in a couple of months. He's 28. He doesn't broadcast it, and he'll probably kill me for broadcasting it. But I'm proud of him. And I, frankly, you know, it's not easy. It is not easy to be consistently faithful. 
So in your prayer life, you pray for that. In your prayer life, you pray for purity and holiness that you might represent the Lord Jesus Christ all the days of your life with your mouth, with your eyes, with your hands. You know what's funny? Jennifer said, I, dress, I don't dress my husband. I have to say the opposite. My husband dressed me today. I said, I have three choices. He said, I want to see him before you go out there. I put on the first one. He goes, no. I go, why not? He goes, it looks see-through. I said, it is not even. He said, it looks. I take it off. I put the next one on. He goes, it looks nice. But she's not going to look this way. This one. Okay. I, I said, it's the absolute most conservative thing I could possibly wear. He goes, that's right. That's perfect. <laughs> your purity all the days of your life. I had a young college boy yesterday say a word in front of me he knows I hate. It's not actually a swear word, but it's kind of close. And he goes, ah, oh, sorry, Becky. You don't need it. Purity. When I was a coach, purity. You didn't hear anything out of my mouth. Purpose, I'm asking you. Be the generation that brings in this harvest. And I'm going to tell you what Charles Spurgeon said. He said he preached the message and people were ready to come to Christ, but he had a whole army of people in his church who would watch during the service. Heads bow, people scrunch, people get concerned, people sitting in the back, and they would go right after those people and say, do you want to go forward? Can I take you forward? Is this for you today? Is God calling you? You and I need to be the sole winners. Don't leave it up to the pastor. You and I... You and I, for a million to come to Christ, it would only mean what? Each of us lead a hundred before the end of the year? Is that right? A thousand times a hundred? Okay, maybe a thousand. Whatever it is, are you in? Why don't you, why aren't you convincing me? Okay, then I'm going to have to call it out. In the area of prayer, how many of you would like to make a decision today? I made a decision to spend one hour a day with God for the rest of my life 24 years ago, February. God may say to you, 10 minutes in the word, 10 minutes in the prayer, all the days of your life. God may say, I want way more than that. God may say something to you today, but I'm looking for lifers. I'm looking for people that will let the Holy Spirit of the living God and the word of God impact their lives every single day, all the days of their lives, because... That's their bread and butter. That's their meat and potatoes. That's where they're going to get what they need. Not from their friends, not from the good word, but from the word of God. If God is asking you for a lifetime commitment, would you just stand? If God is calling you to purity today, and I mean get rid of it, whatever it is, I want you on your knees on your knees right now. And my friends, I mean it. This isn't just a good word about purpose. I've equipped you with, <laughs> and I, I, if Charles Spurgeon was here, I know he'd say, the chief business of the Christian is soul winning. Can you get that seed in your heart? Can you get fired up about that? Can you, can you see the people you're to lead to Christ? No fear. They're, they aren't going to turn you off and turn you away. They need it. They want it. God, when God <clears throat> presses his thumb upon your back, it is because he's saying, go. It's me in you telling you, go. Don't take no for an answer. Raise your hand if you know the person right now that God has put in your heart to bring to him this year, 2008. In this time of ministry, I want to ask you, 
as you worship and pray, to take someone next to you and tell them what God has said to you. Tell them what you've said to God. Don't leave this room, this mountaintop, without recording it in ink and blood. You get a piece of paper, tell a friend who will keep you accountable. This is what God said to me. This is what I said back to him. Let's become lifers together in prayer, purity, and purpose. Amen? Amen. Holy Spirit of the living God, we end this year together in a most amazing way. We ask you to fill us with an extra measure, overflowing, an immediate outpouring of your Holy Spirit. Break any chains, open any eyes, fill every heart. And you know what? Maybe somebody has brought you here. And you've never asked Jesus Christ to come into your life. You're a visitor, you're a friend, you're a family member. Maybe you need a janitor. I'd like you to just come forward right now, if that's you. Is there anybody? Would you just come forward and come pray with me? Right now, if you've never asked Jesus Christ into your life, you say, I believe, I will repent. I will invite the Holy Spirit of the living God into my life. I want to expect him and feel it. Is there anyone? Maybe you're just a young child and your parents have brought you and you're like, I'm in. Come forward. 